Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ann Bennett. I'm the Executive Director of the Laurel Historical Society here in Maryland. And I want to welcome you to our next installment of our collections conversation. This month we are focusing on Montpelier, Snow Hill, and the Gardens of Laurel. And so I have some very special guest panelists with me today. Uh, and we are recording this appropriately enough on April 22nd, which is Earth Day this year. So happy Earth Day, everyone. So I encourage you today or whenever you're watching the video uh, to go out and do something beautiful, even though it is a little chilly today. That's why I have my scarf and sweater on. Uh, there are uh, so many wonderful ways that we can uh, celebrate Earth Day here uh, in Laurel or wherever you're watching from. So I encourage you to go out and celebrate Earth Day. Uh, so I am joined, uh, just quick introductions with several of our panelists. I am joined, uh, as always, with uh, Monica, our assistant director from the Laurel Historical Society, and I'll let each of our guest panelists introduce themselves better uh, as they go through each section. We also have Sandra Johnson. Sandra has joined us again this month. Uh, Sandra is the church historian at St. Mark's uh, Church uh, here in Laurel. And then we're also joined by Mary Jerkowitz. She is the museum manager over at Montpelier Mansion. Uh, and she'll be, she'll be talking to us a little bit about the history of Montpelier Mansion uh, and the beautiful gardens and landscape that they have over there. But before I get started, oops, let's go back if I can. There we go. Can everyone see our beautiful mountain laurel? So just real quick before we get started, uh, since we are the Laurel Historical Society and uh, St. Mark's and even Montpelier is located in Laurel, I just wanted to say real quick that the city of Laurel gets its name from the mountain laurel that you can find in the area. Uh, the mountain laurel is a common site across pretty much the eastern half of the United States all the way from Florida to Maine and from the Mississippi River on to the east coast. In addition to giving the name to the city of Laurel, uh, it is the state flower for two states, uh, for Connecticut and Pennsylvania. And if you've ever driven uh, west on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, you'll know that you go through the Laurel Highlands. So you can see this, um, this evergreen shrub and the beautiful pink white flowers uh, that bloom from it. So uh, and this is a great time of year to see it as well. So mm -hmm. the city of Laurel, uh, gets its name from the mountain laurel. So this is just a, a snip that we have from the Snow Hill Garden Club program, and we'll be talking about them just a little bit later. Okay, so uh, this is Mary's section. So Mary, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to take it over and let us uh, hear all about the, the history and the interpretation in the gardens of Montpelier Mansion. Thank you. I really, first thing I want to do is uh, thank Anne and Monica for inviting me. So um, as Anne introduced me, as I'm Mary Jerkowitz and I'm the uh, site manager for Montpelier Historic House uh, Museum. And uh, it is Montpelier right now sits on 70 acres uh, of parkland. Um, the map that I am first showing you over here um, I just wanted to share it with you because um, it is a good map to kind of get you an idea of um, what encompass the Snowden properties in the area. Uh, this particular map was drawn by Stanley D. Hunter, and he um, and he uh, put it together for the book that some of you probably are very familiar with, A Church and Its Village, uh, which is uh, the book written by Sally uh, Mitchell Buckley, and it documented the history of the um, St. Philip's uh, Episcopal Church. Uh, when um, she was writing the book, uh, she did contact us, and um, also the gentleman who put together the map, Stanley D. Hunter, Eventually, he donated uh, how he came about to put this map together. And as you can see at the top, it was very specific for that, uh, but we wanted to be able to use the map for some interpretation exhibits that we did. And I thought he had done such a wonderful job of um, 
doing the map that uh, it would be something good to add to our collections. So this particular map is available. Um, and what I wanted to point out to, and I hope that all of you can see it, is um, it does show the Patuxent River, and and uh, which is uh, you know it really talks about uh, you know a village and and the rivers. You know, always uh, there's a, some connection to the river. So you see the two forks of the Patuxent River. And then you also see the area of what became or is now the Laurel area. Um, I don't know if you, if uh, Ann Bennett can point to it on the map. Um, and then you can also, and we'll be able to see the location of where Montpelier um, is located. And what he did on this map was so interesting is that he did put the roads as best as he thought as they were running at that time. Um, and so we may be getting back and talking about this map a little bit more. That's great. And then go ahead and circle the, the lower area, which is uh, at the top there, right before you get to the river, so you can get a reference of the map. Um, and really, as we're going to be talking the rest of the, um, the day, uh, not the day, but the next hour. We don't have, well, I could, I could speak for a whole day, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, uh, so I think that the history of Laurel, the city of Laurel and uh, the history of Montpelier and the Snowdens are interconnected. One goes with the other. So it's uh, rare not to be able to, to not speak about one without the other. So, if you were to start at the very beginning, so to speak, um, I'm sure you, some of you folks may know about the dinosaur park. So before anything, and I'm not a, pa a paleontologist in any way, shape or form. So you will see, you know, we'll talk about, uh, I'll just mention the land of the dinosaurs because uh, if we start at the very beginning, that's where it starts. Uh, then if we moved on to human existence, and I know that, and you are, you are a uh, archaeologist by trade, is that correct? Yes. Uh, so I think that this dated to about 20,000 or so years, uh, which these areas of Laurel were the traditional territories of the Konoi Piscataway, uh, the Potoxent, and the Matapanint. And I hope I said those right. Probably not, but forgive me for... Uh, the mispronunciation. Uh, so this, you know, these were the traditional lands uh, of these indigenous groups, which of course the Konoi Piscataway are still with us. Um, and you can check their websites. Uh, you also perhaps have heard of Piscataway Park in the southern part of Prince George's County. Uh, they also have a wonderful um, website that you can check out to learn more about these groups. So I gave you the reference point on the map. So I'm sure you heard of the Patuxent Ironworks. They were along, uh, they were, uh, along the Patuxent River on the Anne Arundel County side of Montpelier. So here you have Montpelier is probably built about fifth generation uh, by uh, the title uh, Major Thomas Newton. And you cannot speak about Montpelier without speaking about the enslaved African Americans who were enslaved uh, throughout the almost 9,000 acres of land uh, that encompassed anything between the South River in Anne County all the way through areas of Montgomery County up into Howard County and in to, and of course, uh, Prince George's County, where we're at, and that would be as far down as uh, the Beltsville USDA lands. Um, and we have to acknowledge um, that up through the Civil War, um, the Snowdens did, the Snowdens connected directly with Montpelier, um, did farming with enslaved labor. Uh, and up through Juliana Maria Snowden, who you probably, some of you have heard, and her husband, Dr. Theodore Jenkins, on Montpelier, uh, they were enslaved 
uh, people working, living uh, at Montpelier. So it goes without saying that all farming, including tending to gardens, that what we're going to be talking most about today, was the work that done by, was done by the slaves, uh, by the enslaved. As most plantations in Prince George's County, historically, tobacco was the first a major crop. Uh, and of course, we talking about Earth Day, and as we probably all know, it was a, it's not an environmentally sustainable crop. Uh, they needed really large, large tracts of land, um, and they had to lay it fallow for like 10 years at a time in order to let it recuperate because it drains, it drains the, uh, the earth from so much nutrients. Um, so I think that's probably one of the reasons why they encompass so much, so much property, uh, because they had to cut down, uh, the trees and, you know, once they farmed that land for that many years, uh, they had to go on and move on to other areas. Uh, so they did eventually move on to farming, uh, other types of crops like wheat and corn among many others. Uh, so the landscape has changed. Um, what you see at Montpelier today, it is not the landscape uh, of when Montpelier was first built, and which is the image that you see here. Um, and this is from the Thomas book by Lawrence Buckley Thomas. We do have this book in our archival collections. Um, and I want you to use your, you know, your observation uh, skills here, as you can see, uh, all, this book is 1896 and is being credited on the image that is 1800. So this is, pro this, as far as we know, the earliest image that we have of Montpelier. This shows a little bit of the, of the natural environment on there. So that those hedges that you see at the bottom of the, of the, of the image are probably boxwood. Um, and you know, nature will do its thing. So maybe some, some, probably those trees that you see, you see there are, are long gone and there's new, uh, new trees surrounding, surrounded at uh, the front. This is the front of the mansion. And uh, you will also in, in, as we look at the slides, you will also see how the look of the house had changed over time by different owners and what was there, some of it was taken out um, through uh, restoration processes. But what you see today, honestly, is not what you probably would have encountered uh, or seen uh, back in the um, 1800s. So go ahead to the next slide. Um, I was trying to figure out where exactly this aerial view came from and I couldn't document it. Uh, so I have more homework to do guys. Uh, so here you have the at 1930s aerial view uh, that gives you kind of the look of, and this is when um, Breckenridge Long and his wife, Christine, uh, they purchased the, par the property in 1938. Now, between the time that the Snowdens uh, owned the property, the last uh, the last two owners were the two sis were two sisters uh, who inherited uh, the house from Julia uh, Julia that I um, that I mentioned earlier, uh, and uh, and Theodore Jenkins. The two sisters uh, did not marry, and they sold the property um, out of the family. So, in this particular aerial view. Um, this is a uh, when the longs own it. So um, I'm going to need Anne to do a little bit of pointing for you if she can find her, uh, a pointer there. Is the property that, uh, that you see, which is like looks like a brighter yellow in the middle or front section of it, that property um, up through where you start seeing trees, uh, it's um, we still is still part of the property. What's what I could consider behind, which would be um, on the other side, Anne. Okay. Uh, did, I get, did I get that circle right? So this is that the circle is right now. I want okay. you to make a, a another circle across from that. 
uh, back here, back like across the tree line no no um the other open area and then like three trees in the middle no ah, no <laughs> well we we have we right now the commission still owns part of that but the area that i wanted to reference is will be go go left of the image and to the middle like yes right there all of that became the community of montpelier which is the complex behind and so all of that is now private property where there's lots of house you know the housing complex that i'll talk a little bit about uh later uh and then if you see if you look towards the top of the photograph you don't need to circle that and um, but i think that that may be in the distance may be uh parts of of laurel it's a little bit hard to to view the photograph i know um that's why i think i really need to find the repository and be, make it something to go on on montpelier's website page um because it's a one of the few photographs that really shows kind of the expanse of the area so in this photograph you really cannot see a route 197 or a route 198 because they still had not been laid out um but if you look to the left of the photograph far left of the photograph at the top um you are heading there towards uh towards the city of the city of laurel question oh yes um so that building on the right side in the lighter part of the land mm -hmm. is that the the barn it was the barn that okay. particular it, yes yes it's, it's a good question because that particular barn was built in in the 1920s by the owner before before the longs and it was still up by in 1976 and the commission had made plans uh to um turn it into an art center and the plans were already laid out but uh, the barn burned down uh there was um from from what i heard the story is that kids went in there and they um were playing i don't know if it was intentional or accidental but uh, they were playing with uh, matches and set the place of fire and so the silo was the only part of the of that barn that was left so the Maryland National Park and Planning Commission rebuilt it to now house the art center yeah you you pointed it out but if you look to um if you look at the, all the other areas uh, across from that building all of that is now the parking lot of montpelier uh, um, there's another house that you see there or near some uh, some uh, trees a tree line and that we think was the caretaker's house at that time and that is gone um and so this is a great a great photograph to study so i'm hoping to find the original find the where what the repository is really be is at and then go from there to make it available because i think it's a very great photograph is uh, for the whole laurel community to to look at um so moving on to our next uh, photograph and you know what I, I i was not very sharp at the beginning there in consideration that i should have said that we are in the department of parks and recreation for prince george's county the maryland national park and planning commission um is uh the owner of the pro the property and um it came into the hands of the commission and i'll use commission as the short for maryland national park and planning commission um in the in night in the 1960s um so here is out oh, in these images that i'm sharing um you will see across the top it says habs uh these photographs come from um can you tell me what slide number we're on uh, we're on slide six, got it. Okay, this image is from the Historic American Buildings Survey. 
And it's a series of pictures um, that are part of the Library of Congress collection in the prints and photographs division. And these photo photographs were taken during the time of, of course, the depression. And this was a way that the federal government was producing uh, jobs for artists. So they sent artists throughout the United States to document uh, historic places. So we really wouldn't have these photographs if it wouldn't have been for that project. They were employing photo you know, professional photographers to go out and document this property. So this particular entrance, we don't think and you know, it was at the what is now Montpelier Drive because it probably didn't exist. So it's possibility that 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 this was the entrance of somewhere along the line where Route One Ninety Seven is at now. Um, and um, it's a pretty pretty amazing looking entrance, isn't it? Now I do not know if this was the entrance when the Snowdens um, owned the property. Um, okay, and you guys are probably going to recognize this photograph, and you're probably also going to recognize the the photographer. Um, this is the look of Montpelier in 1912, and Robert H. Sandler Jr., I think you guys have the collection of his photography plates, is that correct, Monica and um, Anne? So I do not know if you have this particular plate, I do not know how it came to Montpelier. Uh, of course, this is a, a copy, it's not the original, and it has been sitting on a, in a frame uh, in one of our cases. But this particular look, I mentioned to you the earlier view of 1800s, as you can see all those boxwoods that are lining the walkway. Uh, those were not original and most likely planted by later owners. So those eventually had, had overgrown so much, um, they had gotten so large that the Maryland National Park and Planning Commission did remove them eventually. And that particular porch that you see, and I like to say it is the Victorian look, um, that was removed. Um, but I think that may have been removed by the longs. Uh, and then you also see all the ivy, which is a no-no for historic buildings when you talk about historic preservation. So all that also was removed. Um, let's go on to next slide. And um, um, here's when you're going to start to get into more of the photography of the grounds. And here you see an image that was put together for us uh, by an intern, Carissa Demore. And she was, um, uh, at the time that she did it, which I think this was about seven or eight years ago, um, this was for her project for the Historic Preservation pro, uh, Program at the University of Maryland. And we have started to, we have been using it in some of our brochures, but it also kind of shows you what is left of, uh, of the property. I mentioned to you the parking lot, and that's like the area on the left. Uh, you see the art center, which is the barn that you also saw on the previous photograph. And um, the road that you see at the bottom right uh, of, of, of the image is Route 197. Uh, and then you see the road as it leads out of the property, which would have been, which has been, as far as we know, um, an entrance probably from about 1960 or so. And, uh, but no, we don't use that entrance anymore because it's a gravel road. All the entrance to the complex is now off of Merkirk. Uh, off of Merkirk. Mary, we have a question. Okay, good. Okay. Go ahead, Monica. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, someone asks, uh, do you know where the slave quarters for Montpelier may have been? No, we do not. And that is a constant question that we get. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we're going to be working on. Um, we are going to be starting some archaeological investigations. Not that there had not been any archaeological investigations in the past. There have been. Uh, there was been one done in 1990 and one done uh, in um, recently, no, 19, I think I'm mixing up my dates. 
uh, but uh, the most recent one uh, was done in 2014. Yeah, 1990, that's correct. And the areas that were studied um, were closest to the house. Um, maybe in a later slide, I can show you the, what is called the, the East Wing is where the kitchen was. And right outside of that, the archaeological investigation showed that there was a smokehouse there. So we do know that, and there was also a lot of artifacts collected. So we do know that, of course, outside of the kitchen, probably there could have been some living, some living spaces. We are going to be putting some funds towards doing some of that research coming up but we have to do it piecemeal. As you all know, it's always a money thing. Um, you always need funding. And so we're gonna start doing more very specific search to see if that can be found. Um, the, one of the reports said that there may have been a cemetery also, and that is what we're gonna be specifically looking into within the next year or so. Thank you for that question. Uh, Okay, uh, let's move on and talking about um, the question that you just, um, that we just had. Here we have one of the uh, most recent acquisitions to Montpelier. This donation just came to us about maybe a year ago. And uh, it, may, it looks really strange, I know. Uh, this is called an ingot. And what it is, is an iron bar, uh, and this particular one was found in the James River. Um, this, is, this could be a whole separate um, presentation to go into, so I'm just touching on it. Um, but for, for Montpelier, it's a major acquisition because it is a tangible artifact that will help us tell um, the history of the people that were held in bondage because the Patuxent Iron Works, the majority of the workers there uh, originally were uh, African American. And so this was the product of their work. Uh, it's an 100 pound um, ingot, as you can see on the image, and is dated to 1746. Now, Montpelier is. is uh, um, dated to 1783. So by the time that um, uh, Major Tom, Thomas Snowden um, is credited with uh, being the proprietor of the house or who built the house, he was a uh, part owner in, in this business. He, he was not a full owner in it, but you could say that from the work of the enslaved is what provided the wealth that uh, allowed them to have such such a place. And we are going to be doing a lot more research into this so to connect the history of the Patuxent Ironworks with the property of Montpelier. The Ironworks sat across from Montpelier, uh, across the river. So the, so the Ironworks was in the Anne Arundel County side and Montpelier, of course, in the Prince George's County side. And, um, we are going to be trying to connect that history. And now with this object, we're hoping to build an entire exhibit around it to talk about more uh, about the industrial, uh, the industrial work that uh, was being done in Laurel. The next slide shows you a plow. And this particular plow, uh, was made at uh, Montpelier, uh, is not in our collection because it's in the collection of uh, Mount Vernon. And this is a plow that was ordered by George Washington. There is a couple of letters in which he corresponded with Major Thomas Snowden making the order for this particular plow. And uh, once again, we go to, to the work of the enslaved, this particular object most likely was made uh, by a blacksmith at Montpelier. Um, and um, we did uh, speak with uh, the collections uh, administrators in uh, 
and Mount Vernon, and of course they they are not going to part with anything. Um, the best that we the, the best that they could do for us is send us photographs. Um, so this is um, so the photo. This is the, our collections item is is the photograph itself. Um, and let's see what else can I tell you about this item. Um, once again, you know we're going to be um, talking more about this in in our interpretation. Um, okay, let's move on to the next slide. Sorry about that. So I mentioned to you earlier uh, about uh, the Longs owning the property. Christine Long Wilcox was um, the daughter of Breckenridge Long and, and his wife, also named Christine. And so Christine Long, when she inherited Mon uh, Montpelier, um, she sold property. Um, what I mentioned on that on that aerial uh, photograph earlier, um, this community is what was built. What I what I call behind Montpelier, uh, and this was a Levitt community. Um, and so the developer uh, Levitt and Sons built the Montpelier community that now sits um, behind Montpelier. And as you can see in this image, you see where it says mansion on the right uh, bottom of the photograph, my right bottom of the photograph. Uh, and so you see the entire property then became um, that complex. Uh, and she sold it to, to um, Lebet and Sons before she donated Montpelier, uh, the house in eight acres to the commission. Uh, the commission later bought uh, from her the initial acreage that goes from, I guess, the, what I could consider the front of the house towards Route 197, and um, open space funds from the state of Maryland were used to be able to purchase the rest of that land, which we basically referred as to the fields, which were probably f have been f were uh, farmed. Uh, for 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 a long time. Next image, and this is what the fields look like right now. Uh, that area that looks towards 197 would have eventually looked towards the Patuxent River. Next slide. Uh, when we talk about uh, collections uh, at Montpelier the grounds, the entire complex is uh, part of our collection uh, and, and the building and all the buildings uh, that are within it are also uh, in this particular uh, building, the summer house, uh, as far as we know, has been there since, uh, since 1794. Uh, and is, um, as far as we know, the second oldest in the East Coast and still in its original foundation. Next slide. And now we're getting more into the views of the grounds. So on the left, on the left image um, is the entrance um, to what's considered the river entrance or the front entrance of the house. And that particular gate, um, once again, more research, more research. It's um, needs, we need to document how or when that particular gate was put on there. And on the right, uh, this is uh, behind the carriage house. We have had this statue stored in the basement of the house for the longest time. Uh, and we didn't know where it belonged or where it came from, but we finally were able to determine that this was a spot where it was. Um, during, after, uh, during the 1970s, when um, in between the time that the commission acquired the property, uh, the area was, um, subject to, to vandalism. And so I guess somebody may have made a decision to remove whatever statues may be in around and put them, uh, put them in the basement. So we reinstalled this back maybe about five or so years ago. Um, and I also want to give you a disclaimer that I am not a gardener. Uh, 
go back one slide. Thank you. I am not a gardener and I, I and I'm not an arborist. So everything that I have learned, I've learned from the crews that come to work on the site or information that we find in the files. So um, here we go into um, what I guess all of you are expecting is talk about gardens, right? Um, well, um, this is the Osage orange tree that is, in, that is uh, right outside of the east wing of the house and you have two views there of uh, what it looks uh, in the winter time and, and it's a late blooming Osage orange and on the right you see what it looks like when uh, in the summertime when it's finally uh, all green uh, and it, what is an orange orange tree as far as I know is not native to Maryland but it is native from somewhere in the Midwest um, it is the second oldest in the county, in Prince George's County. Uh, I think the, the oldest one of this type of tree is um, at another historic site in the southern part of Maryland. The tree um, was used uh, for creating fencing by planting the trees together. Uh, so this, I guess, is rather unusual for one of them to become so big like this. Um, it's a male, I've been told, and so it doesn't produce those funny looking uh, fruit, like an orange, but not to, I think of it as brain, you know, it looks like brains. <laughs> uh, and there are um, no blossoms on this tree. So it, you don't really start to see leaves on it until, until June. You can go ahead to the next slide. So, the grounds are a um, lovely place to go through and you know enjoy it all different times of the season. Uh, I don't know if we have anybody but wants to jump in and help me identify uh, the image on the left. Um, I know that if we have gardeners in the group, you may be um, anybody. Okay, um, it's a magnolia. And there's several magnolias throughout the grounds. There's many types. Don't, don't, don't go asking me what type this is. I just know it's a magnolia and it's very pretty. And I just took a picture of it because it's, because it's really, it's really lovely. Uh, the other image of it's when, when um, that, that road that you have seen, then now um, it goes to Montpelier Drive. If you walk on that on a snowy, on a snowy day, it's a pretty lovely. Uh, Somebody's helping us out. It says Japanese or what does that say? Japanese or saucer magnolia. Ah, okay. That's wonderful. I never knew that there was actually different types. <laughs> oh my gosh, they see that. What did I, I tell you? There's yeah. several. And actually, all, not all magnolias are trees. Uh, you have bushes. And there's some bushes at Montpelier of a different type of magnolia. And it's like a white flower. Um, so there you go. And I think there's another different type on the grounds too. Uh, and then at the bottom is just another shot so that you can see what the ground, kind of what the grounds look in early spring with the summer house in the boxwood, uh, the boxwood maze that you can see that it doesn't look like a maze from the image, but, but it is. Um, next slide. And this is, um, rather unusual uh, tree. It was, I've looked at photographs, uh, so we definitely know that this tree was not, that was not in that circle uh, in, the, in the 19, in the, before the Longs purchased the property. And the Longs purchased the property in 1928. And as far as we know, this particular, um, Dogwood, yeah, it is a dogwood. Some people come and tell us, no, it can't be, but it is. Um, and it is a double blossom dogwood. And I just looked this up and because it had been called a triple. And then I looked it up and guess what? A good old article from the Laurel Leader, May, May 7th, uh, 1981, uh, Dr. Fred Mayer, a botanist at the National Arboretum in D.C., I guess he knows his stuff. Um, they have a similar, uh, they had, I don't know if they still do, a similar dogwood. And here we go with the Latin names that I'm so bad at. 
pluribracteata, I think is how you say it. And it's uh, Latin, uh, of course, for many petals. That's what it means, many petals. And um, you can have up to, what is it? Um, pretty large, 20 petals. You can have up to 20 petals uh, on that. Uh, so you can see there uh, a close up of what the blossoms look. And if you, anybody on uh, presently on the talk wants to go see it, you better hurry because um, it usually only stays in bloom through the, about the second week of May. If it's been warm, it may be not last that long. Um, and I don't know if the blossoms are gonna hang on with all the windy days yesterday and today. I don't know if the, the blossoms are still gonna be there. Uh, and so what's interesting about this is that it's a, it's a um, we don't know where it came from, um, where the longs were, were got this tree. And it is um, the, in the same article, um, Dr. Mayer says that it's a cross, bead, a cross breed called a sport and it's sterile. And so it does bears no fruit and it can only be propagated by cutting or grafting. Um, and so both the Arboretum has tried to graph it to no success. And there was, I think other folk, other gardeners in the Laurel area have tried to, um, and have not been successful. We're always crossing our fingers that it's not going to die on us because it, it is a really beautiful tree. Next. Uh, and this is just my, my photography, me trying to show different angles. Um, the photograph on the right shows you the uh, dogwood in the back in the background in bloom, and that is a, a another tree that is near. Actually, is right outside of our office, and that is a uh, Japanese maple. That's as much as I know about it. Um, the one on the left is another tree that our uh, horticulture uh, arborist team is trying to hang on to. It's lost several limbs. And I'm sorry, I ran out of time to look the name of this one up. But all of you gardeners on the on the uh, on the chat here, go ahead and take go take a look at it. And maybe, maybe there's still a, a label on it. Um, years ago, arborists went through and put labels on some of the trees or the most unique ones. But you know what happens when a tree is growing? And they have popped out. <laughs> so some of them don't have the labels anymore. Something else that we need to we need to work on. Um, next. Ah, this is the next very interesting slide that I had to take notes for because I didn't know anything about it. Is um is this one sits behind the carriage house? And uh, was, there was some uh, drainage work done around the, around the carriage house in, uh, in, in 1990, 1920. I'm missing up my dates here. Uh, in 1994. And the, um, it's called a Ponserus trifoliata, known as much easier, hardy orange or a flying dragon. And it's original to China. Uh, the fruit is very sour. And one day when it was in orange, you know, the, the, when the fruit was really yellow, I went and I grabbed one and I cut it to look into it. And I was like, well, you can't eat this. Uh, and you can't really, it's just, um, you have, it's usually done to make, to make it into marmalades and for, and the Chinese use it for medicinal purposes. I just think it's just absolutely beautiful. Photograph on the top left is what it looks like when it's in bloom. And this particular day, actually this was COVID time. Um, I went out and I took some video because the bees love that tree. And it was just, when it's in bloom, it's just absolutely beautiful. Next. 
And I just want to give you some shots of the herb garden. Do we know where the herb gardens, where, where the herb garden or flower gardens and so forth, and even if the Snowdens had it, we don't know. Uh, we, uh, uh, we worked with um, Carol Chomet, who is a landscape, uh, landscape uh, professional, and she took a bunch of our books from our library, uh, having to do with anything with colonial gardening, and she came up with a plan to put together this, the garden that you now see at Montpelier, which is a fenced in area. And this is when it's all wonderfully in bloom in between now and um, in June. And she put on here, her plan was to put any plants that would have been you would have been planted during that period of time of the Snowden's occupation. Uh, I'll just point to the bottom left photograph, uh, that's indigo, which would have been utilized uh, for um, coloring uh, textiles. And um, you uh, wonderful gardeners on the call probably recognize the rest. Um, so come check out the garden once again, if you have, when you have a chance. Next. And that's what it looks like in, in late summer. It kind of gets wild after a while if the gardeners don't don't keep up with it. But um, this entire garden is rec it's um, what you would consider just a recreation of what we think they may have had, but where they were located. And even if they had one, we don't know. Of course, we do know that there would have been an herb garden because that was utilized with the cooking medicinal. We also know that you know the enslaved would probably would have had their own gardens to grow vegetables and to grow their herbs to supplement uh, to supplement uh, their diet. For because, as we know, and I'm sure some of you have read, they did not receive uh, good nutritional food, so they did have to grow some of their own. And next. Um, on the left is um, a, another beautiful tree on the ground. It's a sycamore. Um, I think that is a native what, to, to the area, to the U.S. And it looks beautiful in the, in the winter time. One of those trees that looks like it has snow on it all the time. And on the right, I was just on a walk and I was totally shocked to see a black squirrel because you've don't see them. I thought that those were primarily southern part of the county and uh, also um, in the eastern shore. So I was really totally shocked to see one at Montpelier. Next. Uh, a, few mother, a few other shots of, of Montpelier in the winter um, and another tree on the left. I'm not sure what type it is. Um, I have to go back and read the label or some of you, if you want to take a shot and identify it now, you can. And I think we have some comments. Oh, just about the prevalence of the squirrels. Uh, someone said that they have about four or five of the black squirrels in the Laurel area, in the historic area. So they might be expanding their territory. Oh, okay. Well, I thought it was like, oh, I've never seen one. Not a black one. I always see, I see all the other ones, but not that. Okay. Um, do I have another slide? I'm not sure. I think there is one more. Oh, well, of course, yeah, and this is most important programming. Um, the outdoors, we use it for a variety of programs. On the left, you see um, our education staff have set up in, um, have been setting up what is called a a playground, kind of like a, you know, so that kids can learn because since the house is so hands off, do not touch, um, they created uh, an area for children to learn about uh, how they used to make things or, and, and it's a very hands on, everything's hands on uh, and COVID put a stop to it. And um, we probably will also rethink on how to to do that particular program. And on the right, um, that is one of the activities that is offered during our Montpelier Festival, Earth's Tea in the Arts, that is coming right up. 
and that should be the last slide. And on the left, you have the information about the festival, which is virtual. And it's this Saturday, starting at one. So you, uh, if you just Google Montpelier Festival Herbs Tea in the Arts, it should take you right to it. Uh, and or you can do, t or you can go to uh, pgparks.com. Uh, and I don't know whether, uh, and I'll, I'll, I will look at, I will try to put the, um, the information on the chat also. And on the right, you have, um, we were talking about magnolias. Um, this is another different type of magnolia. And uh, the members that you see there are dancers uh, with the Silk Road Dance Company. And they're going to be performing as part of the virtual festival. So you'll be able to enjoy the grounds, the festival, a couple of talks this Saturday. So I think I've talked plenty enough and I think I'm done. Okay, Ariel, well, thank you so much, Mary. Yes, I think we got all of the questions and comments as they came through, but if there is anything else, please feel free uh, to, to talk about it and to jump right in, especially uh, since uh, along with Mary uh, that I don't know very much about gardening or trees. So if, if anyone here in the audience does, please feel free to jump in. Uh, we definitely want everyone to learn from your experience as well. Uh, so I am going to pass it over to Sandra Johnson now. She's going to talk a little bit about uh, the history of the Grove and not necessarily all of the history of the community, but the actual history of the Grove and where the name came from uh, and the kind of the one picture that we know of that uh, still sports some of the, the trees that were part of the Oak Grove here in Laurel. So Sandra, I'm going to pass it over to you now and then uh, if you don't mind, I'll advance the slide and we can just focus on that image then. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to first uh, thank the Laura Historical Society just for giving me the opportunity just to give everyone a brief, his, his, well, a brief background as to where the name of the Grove came from. Because as you know, the, the, uh, the Grove is the name of the African-American community in Laurel. And um, the picture that's being shown is uh, taken from uh, Emancipation Park. <clears throat> and you can see the beautiful tree, the, the, the size of the tree. And um, this is now the site of the new library. And on that site of that library, a large oak grove once stood across from St. Mark's Church. Uh, gigantic oak trees, some more than 200 years old, grew there. Um, that's where the, and from the large oak grove, uh, this is where the name of the grove came from for the African American community. And uh, the grove was the area to which Amer African Americans were restricted to live in the 1800s. And uh, as Mary was talking about, when she was talking about the um, uh, the slaves on the Mount Pelier property, that's where our history says that uh, uh, our, the residents from Laurel, from the Grove, really migrated from um, that, uh, that plantation there. Uh, now, just uh, imagine these large trees going from starting at Laurel Avenue and going down H Street all the way past, uh, down, past uh, eastbound uh, 198. So it was a very large oak grove. Uh, in that grove, many, most of the uh, community and church-related activities were held, such as um, emancipation picnics, baseball games. Uh, as I said, a lot of our church-related activities were held there because in the grove, most of the activities were held two places, either at, on the St. Mark's property or in the uh, Oak Grove. Now, uh, as I said, unfortunately, I do not have any pictures of the Grove other than this one that's being shown, because most of the pictures for our the church's historical um, value is just shows the church, but the church is on the other side of the of the Oak Grove. Um, but this. Oak Grove just had so much importance to the Laurel community because, as I said, um, 
our Emancipation Day, uh, which the Emancipation Celebration is the largest festival in Laurel being held since uh, about 1902. Um, and this property, I found out this property belonged to the Charles Stanley family. Charles Stanley was married to Margaret Snowden, a descendant of the Snowden family, the founders of Laurel. Charles and other members of his family allowed the sponsors of the various activities to use the property free of charge. Um, in the late 1950s, the State Road Commission constructed Route, Route 198 through the old groves where all of the trees were taken down and the highway was built. And in fact, um, westbound uh, 198, that was where our church parsonage was placed, was originally placed. And uh, because we did want to keep the building, the parsonage was moved to the other side, right behind uh, where St. Mark's is located now. We still use that building as an annex to our church. But um, all of the trees were taken down, as I said, for the building of the uh, highway. And since that time, other buildings have all, also been constructed on that side of, of the street. Um, where this tree is located on Emancipation Park uh, in 1991. Um, the city uh, dedicated this property as Emancipation Park. And um, it stood there until, well, in 2015, there was another building adjacent to where this picture is, where this picture is. And this was an, an apartment building and um, that apartment building was sold to the city in 2015 because the library, you know, if you, I'm sure all of you remember the size of that small library that was behind, if you can see the uh, pavilion there, the library was placed, was situated behind um, that uh, pavilion and uh, really didn't accommodate the city of Laurel anymore. I mean, because it just, uh, was behind tech, tech uh, you know, the technology was behind. I mean, and they wanted to, you know, construct a state of the art uh, facility for the Laurel community. So that building was sold to the city or to the county. And uh, all of the park where you see that that tree, that's now probably the library parking lot. And um, as I said, all of the trees were just taken down and um you know i just remember the first time that uh, i rode down from because i live in baltimore and as i was coming off of 216 and i rode down a street and i could see all the way down you know because all of the trees were gone uh you know it's it was a kind of an eerie feeling because i was of course glad that progress was taking place and that this facility was going to be built to you know really help the children and the community of laurel but i just knew the beauty of, of all the trees being taken down um there, there was a sadness there because so many important activities happened in this oak grove which was no longer there i mean you know um, in fact, there was a lady who um, was a member of the church, and uh, she's in her upper 90s now. She said when she came to church and she saw, she actually cried because of the importance of the Oak Grove to, you know, to the community, and it was all gone. And uh, I talked to her for a while, said yes, but sometimes, you know, progress has to move on. Just think about what's going to happen and how this new library is going to provide so many services to our children because if the library had moved, uh, our children would no longer have been able to just walk to the library and just to take advantage of the, of the facility. And uh, she said, I, I realize all of that, she said, but you know, all of her childhood memories and the things that, have, you know, had happened and, but you know, as I said, it was like a double-edged sword because the, the trees were just beautiful. Um, 
but so when I, when it was flattened like that, you know, you just hated to see that part of history and that part of Laurel just, you know. But the, the light, at least they did build a beautiful building there because the new library is absolutely gorgeous. But um, as I said, the Oak Grove, um, over the years, if you could talk to, when I talked to um, a lot of our older church and Grove residents, um, they would talk about things like uh, how, because Laurel was in the middle of uh, Baltimore and Washington, how on Emancipation Day, people would come on their horse-driven buggies or come on the train and just stay for the entire weekend. And how what we have now as Emancipation was just doesn't measure up to what they grew up with. And there was just so much importance to that Oak Grove in fact, I was talking to someone about it, and they were saying because the, it was such a beautiful area, and she remembers as a child just going over there, and the blades of grass were so long that, you know, they would, some girls, some of the little girls would just sit there and braid the, the blades of grass <laughs> because it was just so beautiful there, and it was just such a beautiful place to be in the summer because it was shaded, it was cool. You didn't have to be out in the sun. And it was just a nice place just to go. And then in, the, in that Oak Grove, you had baseball diamonds. You had a lot of things that, um, you know, just meant so much to, to the community. And um, because at that time, unfortunately, Laura was, was you know, we just couldn't uh, uh, go to certain places in Laurel because it was quite segregated. And but just to be able to go into the Oak Grove and just uh, just take part in the beauty of the, the trees that were there and to know that you were in a um, an historical place because, you know, uh, the, the, the trees and how it connected to the name of the area where you lived. And it was just a, a beautiful place. And as I said, I, unfortunately, I wish that I had pictures because what you see there, you can see the beauty of the tree, but just imagine trees like that going from, you know, Laurel Avenue past where 198 is and just, uh, you know, and it was really nice that uh, the owners of the property allowed the church and the different uh, fraternal organizations to use this property free of charge all of those, all of those years that it was there. So, um, as I said, I was just glad that uh, and you were, were able to find a picture just to, you know, show how, how beautiful all those large trees were. And um, just wanted to share with you the importance of the, that Oak Grove to uh, the residents, the African-American residents of Laurel. Thank you for that, Sandra. And I think, Monica, you said that you've had this picture set aside for a while, haven't you? It, it struck you early on. It's, it's my desktop background. So <laughs> when, when we were thinking about this program, I said, I think that's the Grove tree. You know, like the, the is, Grove tree. So yeah, it's, it's been my desktop background at work for years. So <laughs> well, I don't know I, where I, it came I, from, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, like Sandra said, I, I, I'll just kind of reiterate and just put out a call to the audience if you have other images uh, of the Grove in, in modern times like this one or maybe historical references, please let Sandra uh, and the Historical Society know because that would be great to have other images and, and to document that history. And, and just like Sandra said, you know, anytime a, a tree is cut down, it, it's really heartbreaking, but especially ones that are just so beautiful and, and just have such a strong connection to the African-American community here in Laurel. Um, and I can just, just as the Sandra was talking, I could just imagine the chain link fence going away, the pavilion going away, and just having many, many trees uh, surrounding that area. So uh, I know there's um, there's been some ideas tossed around and maybe some seeds no pun intended, <laughs> seeds of an idea planted uh, that perhaps it would be something worth pursuing with the city and with other interested individuals and organizations to see if we can't replant some of the oak trees uh, back in this area. 
uh, like Sandra said, the library is beautiful, and if you haven't had a chance to go to the facility, uh, it, it's absolutely great. It, it's a great resource for students and for the children, especially of Laurel. Um, but uh, it's it's a little open and it's a little bare, so I think uh, having uh, oak trees added back to the property would would be a great idea. Uh, so I know that there's been some talk already among some of our board members and Sandra uh, and some of the uh, other uh, community members in Laurel. So uh, if you're interested in, in helping us with that or just kind of keep that seed in the back of your mind as well uh, going forward that we're hoping that uh, maybe before too long we can get the momentum started uh, and have a tree planting campaign that specifically targets, uh, you know, putting the, not only the trees back uh, in the grove, but also uh, continuing that that ongoing history uh, and putting that history of the growth back out there for the rest of the rural community as well. Um, okay, so I think that's that's great. If you and again, if anyone has any comments or questions, feel free to put them in the chat box uh, to Sandra or or myself or Monica uh, or Mary. So I know we're uh, over a little bit, but we just have a few more slides that we want to uh, share with you just to kind of round out uh, all the different histories and different interpretations of garden in the area. So Monica, I think you're just going to take a few minutes here and talk to us about uh, the Snow Hill Garden Club. Okay, go to the next slide, please. Okay, um, so the Snow Hill Garden Club was organized on May 28, 1957 at the home of Mrs. Brian P. Warren. And that's um, Mrs. Warren on the left. Um, on the right is, uh, Snow, is uh, Snow Hill Manor. And it's, it's one of the historic properties in Laurel. Um, it was built in 1755. And um, the club has been doing a lot of civic activities in Laurel in the area, such as landscaping of the Laurel Library, sending gifts to Walter Reed, hospital patients, a, a huge list of things that I can't, I don't have time to name. <laughs> but um, one of the things that a lot of people know them for um, locally is that they contribute, um, well, people at the museum or people who are familiar with the museum, um, they do the wreaths for us every year. Um, we weren't able to do it because of COVID recently, and, but when we have the holiday open house, um, the Snow Hill Garden Club, they meet in the pool room, the municipal pool room, and they meet early, they work all day, and they make the, the, the uh, wreaths. Um, and then, and they're fresh wreaths, they're beautiful, they smell great, um, they bring them over, and we sell them in the shop um, during the holiday open house, and they're a really big hit. Um, they're the reads that you pre-order uh, right right after Thanksgiving. Um, what's in the What's the next slide? Okay, okay, yeah, this one. So this shows so that that the picture on the right is another picture of Snow Hill Manor, and I think is that the inside of Montpelier or is that yeah the one on the left is the inside is the inside of Montpelier. Um, and it just, this, these clippings are from our vertical file. And I think, do they talk about, or did you pull, you pulled these clippings, right, Anne? Did you want yeah, to say something? Yeah, and just real quick, again, okay. talking about, you know, the idea of collections and archives. And like Mary said, you know, the collections and archives can range everything from, you know, these clippings to copies of letters from Mount Vernon, all the way to the building itself. So collections can have a very wide range of meanings. So this was just something I stumbled across after we knew we were going to do the collection conversation on gardens. And it was just uh, a random article from the Laurel Leader in 1878. And kind of what I wanted to point out was a few things is that uh, this was when the Laurel Historical Society was still called the Laurel Horizon Society. That was actually its, its first name when they uh, when they first uh, started in 1875. So that's just kind of a a piece of useless trivia I kind of noticed that the, it was still going by the, his, uh, the Horizon Society when it first started. Uh, and then the other thing that, again, in addition to having Montpelier Mansion and the connection with the Snowden family uh, to Snow Hill, uh, is that I think it's great that back in 1978 that they were also doing a historic house tour. And that's something that we continue to this day. Uh, typically every other year around uh, the holidays in December, we have a historic house tour. Uh, and the last time we held it before COVID, uh, Mary and Montpelier were on it as well. So uh, history is repeating itself. Yes. 
And uh, just real quick, the other thing that I'm going to say is for all of you gardeners out there, uh, especially in the historic area of Laurel, uh, we are also thinking not only of having a historic house tour in December, but we're also thinking of starting a garden tour uh, sometime in the spring coming up. So uh, if any of you are interested, I'm going to put out the call to our audience today, whether you're here with us right now or watching it later. Uh, let us know either in the chat box or by emailing us and we'll put the email uh, in the chat box uh, and you'll see it at the end of the slide as well. It's info at laurelhistoricalsociety.org. Um, but I'm putting the call out to some of our gardeners and uh, green thumbs here in Laurel uh, to maybe start thinking about uh, next year or so as you plant your gardens or do your ball planting in the fall that uh, maybe we'll, we'll tap you to join our garden tour uh, of historic Laurel coming up. So that's just another idea that we have, um, again, planting the seeds uh, coming up, but it's something that please keep in the back of your mind uh, as well. So Monica, I didn't mean to talk so long about that, but again, I thought it was just something fun uh, that just popped out of the archives. Okay, next slide. Okay, and this is just a, this is a picture of, I think it, this is, it's actually from a program about the Snow Hill Garden Club, an, an anniversary that they had, so I apologize that it's so grainy. Um, so I don't know the year, the, it, the photograph didn't have a caption. Um, I assume it must be in the 90s or the early 2000s. Um, so, and they're actually in the museum in the basement section. Um, and it just, I just wanted to show, a, you know, just how long the, cl the club has been going and it's still going, so. Um, and what's the next slide? Oh, okay, here we go. So in 2004, um, the museum did an exhibit called Over, Over Here, Life in Laurel during World War II. And uh, they planted a, a victory garden. So the picture on the right shows the victory garden. Um, the pictures on the, in the middle and on the left um, show just some of the people working in the garden area. Um, which looked like a lot of fun, and the garden is really beautiful. And next slide. Okay, so during that exhibit, um, one of the Laurel Historical Society members, his name is Dave Mann, he worked with the Heirloom Gardens in, in Alabama, a company called Heirloom Gardens, to develop a victory garden kit. And so the kit contained common and heirloom varieties of seeds, plus some of their history, and the seed kits were sold in the museum shop for $10. And I just wanted to show just one of the things, I guess, at the time that something that was in the gift shop that related to the exhibit and to gardening. I don't know if anybody got one, any, anyone in the audience got one, but it looks like it was a lot of fun. Next slide. Um, this is a picture of the Laurel Museum receiving the Golden Shovel Award, and this was in 2003. Um, let's see, so, and that, the, um, in the white dress, that's Betty Compton, um, I guess receiving the, is she holding the shovel? Everybody's holding. So it looks like Jim McSeeny, Betty Compton, the mayor, and is that a previous director? Is that Carol on the left? Does anybody, can someone confirm? Okay, well, anyway, the museum was one of the, uh, yes, okay, Carol Runyon. Thank you, Karen. Um, so the museum was one of the places, one of the places in the city that received the um, Golden Shovel Award that year. Um, and in the background, um, so they're standing on the museum grounds and the blossoms are on the museum grounds. The house that you see on the right side, that's the house next door to the museum. And that's it. Okay, well, thank you, Monica. Uh, yeah, so I know we kind of took a whirlwind tour through Snow Hill, but I think it's so great just how everything is, is kind of layered and a lot of the history goes back to the original Snowden family. Uh, and again, I, I think of this every time I drive up to, you know, Snowden River Parkway, like all the way in Columbia, that it's, you know, their, their reach uh, really affected so many communities. Uh, and uh, people and organizations uh, very early on from the enslaved workers at the mansion all the way uh, to the historic uh, African-American African -American community here in the Grove. 
uh, and to the trees that we just saw. So there is so much history intertwined. So uh, I hope that everyone learned a little bit. I know myself, I learned a lot about the trees and the flowers that I didn't necessarily know before. Uh, and that I just hope everyone came away with a new appreciation uh, of all of the gardens uh, and the different types of interpretation of the gardens in Laurel. So I just want to go through just a few other um, minutes just as we wrap up today. Feel free to type any questions or comments uh, in the chat box as I do that and then we'll stop the recording and uh, we'll let you get on with your beautiful Earth Day today. Uh, so just a reminder that we do have a couple other upcoming programs and events for you. So the very next webinar uh, is going to be coming up on May 6th. That's the Guilford Quarry Cemetery. Uh, that's going to be kind of a belated celebration of Archaeology Month, which is in April. So we'll be hearing about some of the archaeological excavations and the historical and archival research uh, at Guilford Cemetery, which is uh, just north of us in Howard County. Uh, including the connections with uh, possible uh, enslaved burials, as well as the ties into the family uh, history in the Guilford area. Uh, like that, uh, the registration is free. Uh, and if you go to our website, you'll be able just to click the banner image here on our website uh, and go to that. And I'll try to put in the registration link uh, before we end the webinar today as well. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention, and I don't have a picture for it quite yet, uh, but Monica, we have one more collection conversation coming up. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, it's going to be celebrating Jewish American Heritage Month, and I want to say it's going to be May 27th, right? I don't have the calendar in front of me, <laughs> but I think it's the last Thursday. It's the last right. Thursday. This one will be at night. This one will be at 7 o'clock. So... Right. Instead of uh, the dating. Yeah. So that's kind of what we have going on. So we're kind of wrapping out our spring programming uh, and then we'll be moving into our summer camps. And then uh, before you know it, fall will be here. Uh, we do hope to open uh, soon, but we don't have any official announcement or anything like that. So please stay connected with us on social media. Uh, the info email addresses in the chat box. So if you have any questions or comments or follow up, please feel free to contact us that way. Uh, I'm also just going to put a link into our membership page. I uh, invite you to join as members of the Floral Historical Society, uh, as well as become members over at uh, Montpelier and attend uh, their wonderful uh, festival that they have going on this weekend uh, and stay connected with them as well on social media and with their newsletter so that we can make sure that we email you with all the great upcoming events. Uh, and I think I think that brings us to the end of our lecture today. I just want to again thank uh, Mary and Sandra uh, for being here with us and to Monica for all her great research uh, that brought out all this history of the Gardens of Laurel for us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and I'm going to end the recording but we'll stay on for a few extra minutes just in case anyone has any follow-up questions. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us and we hope to see you at the museum or in one of our virtual programs coming up soon. Thank you. Charlie has a question. Charlie has a question um, about the bird in the picture, the, the golden shovel picture. 